morning. Hi, Evelyn. Come on, whenever you're ready. Uh, okay. Uh, I would like to start off by a little bit of background. Um, in 1995, Simon Wiesenthal was visiting London and uh, my brother, Graham Morris, who was sitting among us, invited prominent Jewish figures to a dinner with Simon. And then there was born the Simon Wiesenthal Center in the United Kingdom. The first event uh, was the screening of The Murderers Among Us, The Life of Simon Wiesenthal, which was shown on uh, South Bank, I believe, in the presence of the Duke and Duchess of Kent. After Simon's passing in 2005, Graham, as our chair, created the Simon Wiesenthal Annual Memorial Lecture. It was co-sponsored by University College London Institute of Jewish Studies. And over the years, we've had some remarkable speakers, Anthony Julius, Melanie Phillips, Ed Gaffney, the late Robert Wistrich, and um, Eric Pickles. Uh, I think his uh, title is a uh, UK special envoy for post Holocaust uh, issues. And this year we have Reva Spector Simon. Since our co sponsorship with Harif uh, and uh, Lynn Julius as chair will uh, presently, I mean, shortly uh, focus on that, uh, our center's focus on the Jews of Mena has become of growing importance. I was born in London. And two weeks, it was two weeks after D-Day and I became alert to the power of water. The 30 miles of the channel lay between us and the Holocaust on the continent. In the Wannsee Protocol, we were numbered as 330,000 British Jews listed for extermination. Add to that occupied and Vichy France, they were doomed as 865,000, together with Soviet Jewry and 30 more countries, the death list reached 11 million. Today, water does not count. The Atlantic and the Pacific are tripwires, as tripwires as Jew hatred has gone universal and viral, and it doesn't have any factor. I call our survival the what if factor of history. The MENA factor is less widely known. We are 12 days to the 83rd memorial of Kristallnacht, the 1938 night of broken glass or prelude to the Holocaust in Germany. Many Jews had their own Kristallnachts in Iraq, the Falkud, the inter internment of Libyan Jews, deportation of other European Jews from the regions. So what if Rommel had won El Alamein? The issue in Israel and Mena, Jews, would probably have been annihilated. Just as righteous Gentiles who saved Jews in, at their peril, the few lights in the darkness deserve recognition. Monsif Bey in Tunisia, Mohammed V in Morocco, and lesser placed friends of Jews. And I think that that demands a certain amount of, um, of work. This is our third Zoom in partnership with Harif. And I was struck at the end of each proceedings how relatives and friends stayed on from around the world. Those in Israel, in the UK, in the United States to celebrate life. Tonight, after our close, I believe that the Zoom will be left open for reminiscing until the last person leaves. <laughs> I've learned a lot from Harif and invite its chair, Lynn Julius, author of Uprooted, our 3,000 years of Jewish civilization in the Arab world have vanished overnight. And these are stories that need to be taught in every Jewish school and beyond as lessons for today. Lynn, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Good evening. Um, thank you very much, Shimon. Um, it is a, a, an absolute pleasure to be partnering with you, the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And as you said, this is the third uh, event that we have done uh, jointly. Uh, on behalf of um, my husband Lawrence, who's helping on the technical side, uh, and uh, the five volunteers who constitute the kind of core of Harif, um, I'd like to just mention that our mission is to raise awareness of the uh, history and culture of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. We have a website, www.harif.org, and we invite all those who are not on the mailing list to join us and to join our very active 
uh, Zoom program. Now, uh, there has always been a problem uh, 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 that people just do not know about uh, the history of uh, Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. And we are deeply indebted to Riva uh, Spector Simon, our speaker tonight, because she has filled a huge gap with her excellent book, which I will show here if she doesn't do so herself. Um, there is this misconception that uh, Jews of the Mena were not affected uh, by the Holocaust, but as Shimon has explained, had Rommel not been defeated um, at El Alamein, um, the Nazis probably would have exterminated every community in the Middle East and North Africa. And we're reminded of the strength of um, pro-Nazi feeling uh, in places like uh, Iraq. This year we marked the 80th anniversary of the Farhud, which was the Nazi-inspired uh, massacre of Jews in, in Iraq. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, hand over to um, our speaker tonight, uh, Riva Spector Simon. Yeah, uh, excuse me, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like yes. to come in here. <laughs> yeah, sorry, 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 it's your turn. Okay, no, no, I, I also would like to thank uh, from our side, those who made this uh, meeting possible. Uh, our chair, David Dangle, uh, emer Emeritus Chair, Graham uh, um, Morris, and David Oliver, who has done tro tro Trojan work to, uh, for the Wiesenthal UK, and my staff, uh, Alex Ubelti, Sheila Ryan, and Evelyn Monas, all of whom are here. My wife is sitting here behind me. Um, and so I I'd like to give a little bit more background, uh, which I was sent uh, by um, uh, Riva. And I, I think uh, that's important that as a specialist in the Middle East and North African history, she was educated in Towson State College in the US, followed by an MA from Harvard uh, Center for Middle East Studies. And she went on to a PhD from Columbia University. Uh, she was co-director of the Middle East Institute at Columbia and professor of history at Yeshiva University. And her publications, um, uh, uh, We've seen uh, the, the one that is the title of this uh, uh, webinar, uh, but also the Jews of the Middle East and North Africa in modern times. And um, something which uh, I would dearly love to read, and that is Iraq between the two world, world wars, the militant origins of, um, uh, of tyranny. So welcome Riva, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction, Shimon. And I wish to thank the Wiesenthal Center for inviting me to give this talk. And thank you both to the Wiesenthal Center and Harif for giving me the opportunity to talk about how World War II affected the Jews in the Middle East and North Africa. I would also like to acknowledge the Claims Commission, the Maurice Amato Foundation, and Yeshiva University for their support of this project. Okay, could I have slide two, please? Next one. Okay. Did you know that Egyptian Jews boycotted the sale of German products during the 1930s? That Mein Kampf was serialized in Arabic newspapers. Cities in the Middle East and North Africa, including Tel Aviv and Haifa were bombed. Jews in Tehran saved children from Poland 180 Jews died in an attack on the Baghdad Jewish community in 1941. Algerian Jews helped the allies in the invasion of North Africa, or that Jews in Turkey, Syria, Iran, and Morocco helped European refugees escape the Nazis. When I ask this question, the response is usually something like, I've never heard about this, really? That's why I decided to write about the impact of the war on Jews in the Middle East, even, <laughs> even though, let's be clear, the Holocaust resulted in the slaughter of European Jewry. But while it is true that the Jews of the Middle East and North Africa were not annihilated, 
But don't forget that Jewish communities in the Balkans, in Greece, Rhodes and Rhodes were wiped out. There is a story to tell about Jews in the region. Jews who lived in countries from Morocco to Iran and the impact that World War II had on their lives. Their story is part of the World War II narrative. So how did the war affect the Jews in the region? In this talk, first I'll provide some background information about the Middle East and North African Jewry and then give an overview of how the war affected them. Simply put, there were bombings and invasions, anti-Semitic regulations, forced labor and deportations, attacks on Jewish communities and the impoverish impoverishment of communities. And <clears throat> despite it all, local Jews worked with the allies and provided assistance to refugees escaping from Nazi Europe. First, some background. From the seventh through the end of the 19th century, Jews in the Middle East and North Africa were under Muslim rule. Muslims established a dominant subordinate relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims. The situation began as an expedient measure by a Muslim minority that conquered the region uh, to rule a non-Muslim majority. But gradually the arrangement became part of Islam and is commonly known as the Pact of Omar. Non-Muslims were known as Dimmi, Ahala Dimma, people of the Pact. And as they meet, Jews paid a special tax to the government, the jizya, and there were restrictions on their lives. For example, Jews were not allowed to build new synagogues or practice Judaism publicly. They did degrading or dirty work that Muslims would not do, such as leather tanning and dyeing cloth. They wore special clothes or clothes and colors that Muslims didn't wear so that they could be identified as Jews and they could not join the military. But the community as a community was protected by the ruler. They were his subjects and the Jewish community could govern itself in matters of religion and personal status, such as marriage and divorce. Next slide, please. We should also note that despite the religious struggles and wars within the Islamic world, there was freedom of travel throughout so that we find Jewish communities from Morocco to Central Asia. Now, during the 19th century, the relationship between Jews and Muslims began to change. The Ottoman Empire and some of the regimes in North Africa enacted reforms granting Jews citizenship at a time when Europeans occupied and colonized more and more of the region. Given new opportunities, Jews studied European languages, engaged in trade with European companies, and later filled jobs in the colonial administrations. Next slide, please. Their move to the middle class was facilitated by the creation of a network of Jewish schools uh, by the Alliance Israelite Universelle that taught the French curriculum, modern skills, and even provided a path to university studies in Europe. Western educated Jews became more westernized. Some had British, French, or Italian passports. Next slide, please. Many, many moved out of the old Jewish quarters of Middle Eastern cities to the new European suburbs that were being built. Jews from the countryside, attracted by jobs and economic opportunities, moved to the cities. Next slide, please. Nevertheless, most Jews were poor. Many remained in the old Jewish quarters. And traditional Jews often remained traditional in religious observance. Then with the onset of World War I in 1914 and after the war, the situation of the Jews of the region changed again. The stage for World War II was set. Next slide, please. First, the political map of the region changed. There were new states, Turkey and Iran, for example. Most of the region, however, came under the direct or indirect rule of the European powers. The French occupied Syria, Lebanon, Tunisia, and parts of Morocco. They had already made Algeria part of France. The Italians occupied Libya. The British occupied Egypt and Iraq and ruled the Palestine mandate indirectly. Instead of empires, the Middle East and North Africa was now made up of countries that were either independent or European colonies. 
Each had its own defined borders, its own distinct political orientation, its own economic policy, and its own foreign policy. The one policy that they all agreed about was how to get the colonial powers out of their countries. That meant get the British, the French, and the Italians to leave the Middle East and North Africa. Germany had no colonies in the Middle East. As the political map changed, politics in the region also underwent changes. At first, Jews were optimistic. From Morocco to Iran, secularly educated Jews who came of age in the 1920s identified as culturally Western, religiously Jewish, and nationally as citizens of the state where they lived. Algerian Jews were the exception because in 1870, the Cremieux Decree granted French Jews citizenship. Now, according to the League of Nations standards of human rights, Jews were supposed to be citizens and have equality. Yes, Jews could be citizens, but the reality was that Jews had become a minority as individuals and as individuals in these new countries, they could lose their citizenship because the community as a whole did not have the guaranteed protection by the government that the community had had before. If there was a parliament, there were seats for minorities. The designated Jewish seats generally went to lay leaders of the community and some Jews were appointed to high office. Generally, however, if Jews participated in politics at all, they were active behind the scenes. They contributed financially to political parties or wrote for newspapers, often under different names. Most people kept a low profile and were apolitical. They were loyal to the regime in power. Now, during the 1930s, the nature of politics changed and the optimism of the 1920s receded. Peoples of the region began to assert new identities based on an ethnicity that left Jews out. For example, Persians traced themselves to Indo-European origins and renamed the country Iran. Turks claimed their ancestors were Hittites as they too tried to create an Indo-European identity. They forced their citizens to speak Turkish and Jews were cautioned not to speak Ladino, Judeo-Spanish, in public. Arab nationalists wanted to unite Egypt, the Arabian Peninsula, and the countries of the Fertile Crescent, including the land of Israel, into one Arab entity. Although the idea of Arab nationalism or Arabness began as a secular movement, it soon became clear that Arab nationalism could include Muslims and Christians, but not Jews. This despite the fact that many Iraqi Jews, for example, were educated in government schools and considered themselves to be culturally Arab and there had very little interest in Zionism. Despite pleas to be viewed as Jewish citizens of their various countries, Jew and Zionist, the terms Jew and Zionist began to blur as more Middle Eastern countries became independent and adopted support for the Palestinian Arabs in their foreign policies. At the same time, French anti-Semitic political parties penetrated North Africa, especially in Algeria, which was politically part of mainland France. The European settlers that the French encouraged to live there opposed the 1870 Cremieux Decree that granted Jews French citizenship. They viewed Captain Alfred Dreyfus, who was accused of passing military secrets to Germany as the symbol of the treacherous Jew. <clears throat> Throughout the 1930s, especially in Algeria, Jews found themselves caught between the French settler community that did not consider Jews really French and the Muslims who identified Jews with their colonial overlords. Generally, throughout the region, Jews were caught in the middle between local nationalism and Zionism, and between local nationalism and European colonialism. This situation would have dire ramifications after the war. In addition, during the mid-1930s, Middle Eastern ethnic nationalism became tinged with anti-Semitism. European anti-Semitic literature appeared in the Middle East 
where there were already residues of Western style Christian anti-Semitism, notably blood libels. The most famous is the Damascus blood libel of 1840. The protocols of the elders of Zion was translated into Arabic by the Lebelese Christian priest in 1925 and Mein Kampf was serialized in Arabic newspapers in Iraq and North Africa. Some Muslims even admired Hitler's Mein Kampf as a useful plan of action. After all, Germany was defeated in World War I and had become a world power. And remember, Germany didn't have colonies in the Middle East. The problem was that Arabs were Semites. And in the Nazi racial hierarchy, they were located just a rung above the Jews. The Nazis had to find a way to reconcile a pragmatic political policy in the Middle East with their own racial ideology. <clears throat> German diplomats in the region advised that in Arabic translations of Mein Kampf, anti-Semitism be changed to anti-Judaism. Bosnian Muslims were classified as Islamo-Germans. And the Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajj Amin al-Husseini, was declared to be an Aryan, after all. He had fair skin, reddish hair, and blue eyes. But unlike Mussolini, who advocated organizing Italian expats who lived in Egypt and Libya to the fascist cause, Hitler didn't get involved in the Middle East until the late 1930s. Hitler hoped, that in, hoped for an alliance with Britain and didn't think that the inferior peoples of Asia and Africa could throw off the yoke of the racially superior Anglo-Saxons. Nevertheless, by 1938, there were Nazi party cells that could serve as an effective German fifth column in Lebanon, in Iraq, Egypt, Iran, Afghanistan, Tunisia, Turkey, and the Palestine Mandate. Despite the Nazi diplomatic presence in the Middle East and North Africa, Jews in the region were among the first to take action against the Nazis. In 1933, Egyptian Jews formed the International League Against Racism and Antisemitism and boycotted German goods. The boycott spread throughout communities in the Middle East and North Africa. Initially, there was some Muslim support as local nationalists sought Jewish allies in their struggles against European colonialism. German officials launched a counter campaign against the boycott and instituted a lawsuit. Fearing possible disorders and financial repercussions, the Egyptian and British authorities intervened to halt the boycott. Nevertheless, it continued unofficially on the, on, uh, the individual level. <clears throat> World War II broke out in September of 1939. Here I think uh, that a few words about the war in the Middle East and North Africa will be helpful in understanding about how it affected the Jews. In 1939, it didn't seem that this region would be part of what was essentially a European conflict. The Allies, Britain and France controlled the Mediterranean. Britain with its headquarters in Egypt was dominant in the Eastern Mediterranean where her main concerns were to maintain control of the Suez Canal and to keep oil flowing from the Persian Gulf. The French fleet was stationed in the Western Mediterranean and France occupied most of North Africa. But the Nazi blitzkrieg that resulted in the French surrender in June 1940 brought the Middle East and North Africa directly into the war. The armistice terms that resulted from the French defeat divided France in two. Germany occupied the area in the north and in the south, there was a French controlled government located at Vichy. Most important for the Middle East and North Africa, France's overseas territories and colonies were placed under the jurisdiction of the Vichy government. Uh, next slide, please. The consequences of the French surrender were that Britain now stood alone not only in Europe, but also in the Mediterranean. And the anti-Semitic regulations imposed on Jews in Europe were now extended to Jews in French overseas possessions, namely Syria, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. In terms of war strategy, 
Germany gave Italy the military responsibility for the Middle East and North Africa. Hitler was more concerned with the expansion in Europe and left the Middle East to Mussolini. Mussolini, eager to invade Egypt from his base in Italian-occupied Libya, attacked British forces in September 1940, but failed. As the British pushed Italian forces back into Libya, and it became clear that the Italians were no match for the British, Hitler sent General Erwin Rommel and German troops to North Africa. The result was a back and forth war across Libya that lasted until late 1942. And now fighting against the British, there was a German military presence in North Africa alongside the Italians. By the late spring of 1941, Britain was worried that the Germans and Italians would overrun the Middle East. German armies occupied Greece and the Balkans. The German army was at the borders of Egypt. Bombs were falling on Egypt and Palestine and a pro-Nazi regime was in control of Iraq. Britain stood alone against the Nazi threat in the Eastern Mediterranean. By the end of the summer, however, the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean had improved. British forces defeated the Iraqis in a short war and invaded Syria. Russian and British troops occupied Iran. These Allied victories did not end the war, however, as the war in North Africa continued. In May 1942, the Germans reached El Alamein, some 70 miles from Alexandria. Fear that the Germans would overrun Egypt was palpable. At the British Embassy in Cairo, they were burning diplomatic documents, and they were concerned about the safety of British civilians. The Germans had also taken control of Tunisia from the Italians. Then, in November 1942, the military situation changed again. The successful Allied landing in North Africa, Operation Torch, led the way to Allied victories in Tunisia. And by January 1943, military operations in the Middle East ended. We should note that in 1939, none of the independent countries in the region that had Jewish populations declared war on Germany or Italy. Uh, next slide, please. For Jews, the worst period of World War II was between 1940 and 1943. There were almost a million Jews in the Middle East and North Africa. Overall, Jews, like the rest of the population, suffered from the general impact of the war, shortages and food rationing. Food and essential commodities from North Africa were constantly being sent to Europe to supply the Nazi war effort. There was economic hardship and general deprivation. But there was more. Next slide, please. In addition to the general wartime situation, there were bombings and invasions, anti-Semitic regulations, forced labor and deportations, attacks on Jewish communities, and impoverishment of communities. Next slide, please. Jewish communities that were in war zones were bombed. Between 1940 and 42, Libya was occupied and reoccupied by British and Italian troops. Tripoli and Benghazi were bombed repeatedly. Jews found refuge in underground shelters and in neighboring Libyan Arab villages. As Italian troops moved towards Egypt, Egypt became a target of Axis bombing raids. During the summer of 1941, some 90,000 people fled Alexandria for Cairo as hospitals and the main waterworks of, Al of the city were bombed, flooding a good part of Alexandria. Some 35,000 people also left Cairo when German troops commanded by Rommel reached Al Alamein, 70 miles from Alexandria. The issue the British military had to deal with was where to evacuate British nationals and what would happen to the Jews. British planners in Cairo considered worst case scenarios and thought about moving troops first to Palestine and then to India, but there were no plans for the evacuation of Jewish civilians. In June and July of 1941, some 42 planes bombed Haifa and Acre. 
In one raid, Italian planes dropped nearly four tons of bombs on Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv was an open city and it did not have an early warning system or anti-aircraft guns. 125 people died, 117 Jews, seven Arabs, and one Australian soldier. And there was extensive property damage. The British refused to provide anti-aircraft guns. They said that they didn't have them to defend London, which was also being bombed. Jews in Palestine were worried about an Arab attack from Syria and a German invasion from North Africa. At the same time, they feared for their relatives in Europe as news of the Holocaust reached them. There are stories about Jews in Jerusalem walking around with cyanide capsules in, event that they, in, in the event that Germans invaded Palestine. Leaders of the Jewish community even drew up plans for a Masada-like last stand at Mount Carmel. Jews were subject to anti-Semitic regulations. Beginning in 1940 until 1943-44, the anti-Jewish laws in France affected Jews in Syria, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. Jews in Algeria, which was part of mainland France, lost their citizenship, even if they fought for France during World War I and had medals of valor for their service. The Vichy government that controlled French North Africa instituted anti-Semitic regulations on its own. For example, a Jew couldn't be a banker, money changer, agent for stocks or loans, sports commission or journalist, except for religious or scientific periodicals, could, couldn't be a, theore, a theatrical director or entertainment impresario. There are quotas on the numbers of Jews who could be lawyers and physicians. Now the problem was that quotas on the number of Jewish doctors often affected the whole country because the entire health sector in these countries was dominated by Jews especially European immigrants, so that the general health of the population was endangered. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in Morocco, Jews, and you can, and the, and the next one. In Morocco, Jews had to live in the Mela, the old Jewish quarter, a situation that led to overcrowding and health hazards. And generally, Jews received, received less than half the food rations non-Jewish Europeans received. There were internment and labor camps. Thousands of Jews were sent to internment camps or worked as forced laborers in North Africa. Next slide, please. Robert Satloff notes that as of 2006, the sites of 110 camps in North Africa have been identified. These include 30 in Morocco, 37 in Algeria, 37 in Tunisia, and six in uh, Libya. And I'm sure by now even more uh, have been identified. Now, during the late 1930s, internment camps were set up in southern France uh, near the Spanish border for political prisoners and thousands of refugees fleeing the Nazis from Germany and Austria. When France capitulated to the Nazis, camps were also set up in Morocco and Algeria to intern primarily European Jews, but these also included demobilized Jewish soldiers who had volunteered to serve in the French army, Algerian Jewish political prisoners, refugees taken off passenger ships, and people who had managed to find shelter in Algeria. Next slide, please. Jews from camps in uh, southern France who had been grabbed in raids during the mass deportation of foreign Jews in August 1942 were sent to labor camps in areas under French control in Morocco and Algeria as volunteers. Next slide, please. There, are, there is no record of many of the internees because men who were stateless were, as a result, invisible to foreign relief uh, organizations. Next slide, please. Men were also sent to work on what was known as the Trans-Saharan Railroad, a French plan to link Algeria and Sub-Saharan Africa. They were sent to lay track across more than a thousand miles of desert in areas of strong winds and little water. In daytime temperatures reaching 125 degrees Fahrenheit, followed by bitterly cold nights. Reports about the Vichy camps had reached the press in 1941, but they were discounted. 
One survivor called his camp a French Buchenwald, where torture was common and frequent. Um, uh, next slide, please. Conditions, especially in this Southern Algerian desert were especially severe. Men were shipped south into the desert and packed overheated trains from Algiers and Oran and were herded into camps. Their clothes and blankets were threadbare. Often they had no shoes. Some were killed trying to flee. They built some barracks for their French overseers, but were forced to sleep outside with 40 people packed in tents designed for eight. In other camps, there were no tents. There were holes in the ground, holes in the side of a hill. Each man had to provide his own shelter. Food was gruel and bread. They gathered, broke, loaded, and moved rocks under the broiling sun. Punishments were varied from having to run with sacks containing 80 pounds of rocks strapped on the shoulder and included the ordeal of the tomb where a man was immobilized for as long as eight to 25 days in a ditch the size of a coffin and continually tormented by Arab and Senegalese guards who threw stones at him and hit him with rifle butts. Those who came out alive were lucky. Similar camps were set up in Tunisia when Germans assumed control in late 1942. The Italians established internment camps in Libya. The most, no the most notorious camp was the Giado concentration camp near Tripoli where men, women, and children were sent. Some 562 people died of typhus. Next slide, please. Some Jews were also deported to Italy and later to uh, death camps, I think, uh, some to Bergen-Belsen. Here you have a slide of returnees uh, from the camps. Labor camps were also set up in Eastern Turkey. These were for Jews who were, Jews who were conscripted in the Turkish army in 1940 were sent there. They weren't allowed to bear arms or to serve with Muslims. Jews were also sent to labor camps if they could not or would not pay the exorbitant wealth tax the Turkish government imposed on them. And I'll get to that in a bit. Jewish communities were attacked. The most, the most notorious attack <gasps> on the Jewish community was the attack on the Baghdad Jewish community in June 1941, known as the Farhud. The Iraqi Jews were shocked because they were the most Arabized Jews in the Middle East and had never experienced such an attack. It occurred when, in May 1941, the Iraqis lost a short war against British forces, which by treaty had military bases in Iraq. The Iraqi government was backed by pan-Arab nationalist military officers and the Mufti of Jerusalem, who had found sanctuary in Baghdad after fleeing the British in Palestine. They negotiated with Berlin for support for the war, but didn't receive aid in time. Next slide, please. As retreating soldiers moved towards Baghdad, mobs in the city attacked the Jews on the 1st and 2nd of June, which happened to be the holiday of Shavuot. The attack, or the Farhud as it is called in Arabic, resulted in the deaths of 179 Jews. Some 500 businesses were looted and more than 900 buildings housing more than 12,000 people were pillaged. Some Jews fled to Iran and some went to India, but few could enter Palestine because of the immigration restrictions of the British White Paper. By the end of the summer, calm was restored. Nevertheless, the Farhud was a traumatic event. Next slide, please. And it has had a lasting impact on the Iraqi Jewish community. Uh, this uh, painting always reminds me of Picasso's Guernica from the uh, Spanish Civil War. Next slide, please. Communities were impoverished. In Turkey, the government imposed onerous conditions on the local Jewish community. There was forced conscription in 1940 and men were sent to labor camps. Shortly thereafter, the government imposed an exorbitant wealth tax, the Varlik, that impoverished the Jewish community. It was supposed to attack the wealthy, but hit the poor also. For example, a man who returned to Istanbul from serving in the Turkish military and began to work as a tutor, barely making a living, was double taxed as a big capitalist because his address could be both Istanbul Asia, 
in Istanbul, Europe. As, as you know, Istanbul is uh, both in Asia and in Europe. People could appeal, but few of the appeals were addressed. Those who couldn't pay the tax by the deadline had their property confiscated and were sent to labor camps in Eastern Turkey. Families left behind had no financial support. Confiscated property was taken over by the Turks and never returned. In Tunisia, policy regarding the Jews was made and implemented by the Vichy French and the Italians until late 1942 when the Germans took control. The Germans brought in the SS and began plans for the extermination of the Jewish population. They sent Jews to labor camps to repair bombed out roads, extorted money, and imposed exorbitant fines that bankrupted the community or communities in uh, Tunisia. And as the Allies approached, German troops stole anything they could use. But despite the hardships of war, local Jews worked with the Allies and assisted Jews fleeing from Nazi Europe. Jews in Palestine worked with the British despite British policy restricting Jewish immigration. There were Jews in the police and armed forces with British troops stretched thin, almost 20,000 Jews served in the local police force. By the end of the war, some 30,000 Palestinian Jews served in the British army, despite British reluctance to draft Jews into the army. It wasn't until 1944 that the British authorized the formation of a Jewish brigade. Jews in Syria worked in reconnaissance and sabotage. Arabic speaking Jews from the Middle East and local Syrian Jews were trained to absorb Arab customs, including singing and dancing and backgammon so that they could melt into the local milieu. They spied and laid the groundwork for the British invasion of Syria in June, 1941. And as you know, it was during that invasion that Moshe Dayan lost his eye because the British also had uh, uh, members of Palma. Jews helped the Allies in North Africa, notably in Operation Torch, the Allied landing that was the first major step in the Allies' plan to retake Europe from the Nazis. On November 8, 1942, an Anglo-American force commanded by General Dwight David Eisenhower landed in North, North Africa. A group of 377 poorly armed Jewish volunteers was instrumental in holding strategic points in Algiers until the Americans could enter the city. But American control did not result in the immediate release of Jewish internees in labor camps or the abrogation of the anti-Jewish Vichy regulations. The allies didn't want problems with the local Muslim population. And it took more than a year until the Vichy laws in North Africa were canceled. Throughout the war years, local Jewish communities suffered from discrimination, food shortages and rationing, bombings, deprivation and hardship. But despite the local, difficult local conditions, Middle East and North African Jews assisted European Jewish refugees who were escaping Nazi occupied Europe. So let's look at three examples. Next slide, please. In 1941-42, a large group of Polish Jews, including 871 children, later known as the Tehran children, escaped eastward via the Soviet Union and then went south and entered Iran on their way to Palestine. At the time, Iran was occupied both by the British and the Russians who had invaded the country in September 1941. Jewish refugees were among the civilians fleeing the Nazis and the more than 20,000 Polish soldiers that Stalin allowed to join British forces. The children arrived often traumatized after the death of relatives and their grueling journey wandering through the Soviet war zone from place to place for three years. <clears throat> Sleeping in the woods, half naked, exposed to disease, they were emaciated and malnourished is a consequence of living on next to nothing for two years in shelters that in some cases were no more than disused coal mines. Many died soon after arriving in Iran. At the same time, the impoverished Jewish community 
in Iran was already, and mainly in Tehran, was already supporting Iraqi refugees from the Farhud. They had formed a local Persian Jewish Benevolent Society and a Jewish Relief Committee of Tehran composed of local Persians, Iraqi and European residents. And they raised money from the local community, which was donated to the refugees. For more than a year, the Tehran community was instrumental in providing food, clothing. Some 200 children had unsuitable shoes or no shoes at all. And they provided medical care for the refugees. They saw to the education of children <laughs> until representatives of the Jewish agency arrived to escort the Tehran children to Palestine. Next, please. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Coming. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, before that, the one before. <laughs> I need the map. Thank you. In the Eastern Mediterranean, the escape route for Jewish refugees from Europe was through Turkey. Yes, in the 1930s, Turkey offered academic posts to German Jewish refugees, but it had a mixed record later with regard to Jewish refugees fleeing the Nazis. Turkey, which remained neutral throughout the war, was a center of espionage and agents from all sides operated there. There were German agents, British agents who organized escape lines through Greece and the Balkans for Allied soldiers and POWs, and there were representatives of the Jewish agency who worked with Jewish refugees. Turkey had an on again, off again policy that allowed or refused Jewish refugees to transit through Turkey and either permitted or declared it illegal for Turkish, Jew for Turkish Jews and representatives of the Jewish agency to assist them. Refugees arrived via the Black Sea into Turkey and on to Syria and then to Palestine. From the summer of 1942, through mid-June 1941, 4,800 Jews reached Palestine via Turkey. They came in overcrowded ships from European Black Sea ports to Istanbul and continued from there by train to Palestine through Syria. But official transport was slow going. Only two trains a week with 50 or up to 75 people at a time were permitted to pass through Turkey to the Syrian border and only when one group had left Turkey could the other group begin. From 1942 to 44, Turkey largely stopped transit through Turkey. Now, although the, the Jewish community was financially decimated by the Varlik tax, <clears throat> the leaders of the Istanbul Jewish community formed a refugees rescue committee to house and feed Jews who had made it to Istanbul until they could make their way to Palestine. Then in the Western uh, Mediterranean, <clears throat> there was Casablanca. Casablanca was one of the escape routes from Europe from where tens of thousands of refugees hoped to continue on their journey to reach North and or South America. After France fell, the number of refugees in Morocco increased dramatically. Next slide, please. From 1940 through the end of the war, a young Jewish attorney, Elaine Casas Benatar, helped tens of thousands of refugees who found their way to Morocco. She intervened with civilian and military authorities, provided necessary guarantees, and arranged for housing and medical treatment, often working <laughs> in cooperation with international aid organizations, including uh, the Joint Distribution Committee, HIAS, and later with the uh, Quaker American Friends Service Committee. After Operation Torch, she worked with the Allied authorities to release internees from labor camps and to provide housing and jobs for them. Next, please. Thank you. By the end of 1943, the Allies had moved on to fight the Axis in Italy. Now, there were about 30,000 predominantly Turkish and North African Jews who were stranded in Europe during the war. Now, these Jews used ingenious methods to invade capture by the Nazis, and some were rescued by Turkish, Iranian, and Moroccan Muslims. 
In Morocco and Tunisia, the local rulers, as Shimon mentioned, tried and were sometimes successful in alleviating the harsh conditions imposed on their Jewish subjects by the Vichy government and the Nazis. Jewish soldiers in the British army helped Jews in local communities and reconnected with Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. To conclude, as we've seen from this brief survey, the war did affect Jews in the Middle East and North Africa. They experienced bombed cities, looting, starvation, attacks and murder, deportation and forced labor. In 1945, right after the war, Arab mobs attacked Jewish communities in Egypt, Libya, and Syria. A few years later, when American Jewish aid agencies and the Jewish agency did turn their attention to the quote, forgotten million, they found impoverished communities facing an uncertain political future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Reva, for that superb overview. I don't know how you, you know, pulled all these different threads together, but, but you did it. Um, would anyone like to ask questions? If so, please do write them in the chat. Or the raise way. your hand on or, the electronic reactions. Or raise your hand. <laughs> the electronic reactions. Right, okay. Not your actual hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, can I kick off with, with this question, Reva? You haven't mentioned Afghanistan, which, which has been in the news. Um, I understand that, that the, uh, there was a sort of pro-Nazi um, kind of government there. Was it, am I right? Can you give, up, give us a few details about Afghanistan? No, I, I stopped at Iran. So oh, I, I don't okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps you could talk about Iran because, um, you know, obviously uh, there was a lot of pro-Nazi um, activity there, wasn't there? Where it in Iran or Iran? Iran in Iran. I mean, uh, there was pro-Nazi activity. The Shah had a very the well. The first Shah, the the original Shah Reza Shah, uh, was deposed uh, by uh, the the uh, British and the Russians for being too pro-Nazi, and his and then his son was uh, Mohammad Reza Shah was put uh, uh, was made the uh, ruler of Iran. Iran was in a difficult situation, as was Turkey. I mean, they remained neutral, but they but they needed but uh, they relied on Germany for economic support, so that you had uh, you know uh, German representation in Iran. But they tried to uh, let's put it this way: they tried to limit it to economic support and not uh, not as much to uh, uh, to um, uh, participation, uh, not, participation in Nazi events. Even though von Schirach came to visit as he uh, came uh, throughout the Middle East uh, the, uh, with uh, Nazi youth groups to encourage uh, the youth of, uh, of these countries to uh, attend the, uh, uh, to attend the uh, Berlin games. Mm -hmm. Great. I think David Chamash has a question here. If, if Israel had started 10 years earlier, do you think it would have saved many Jews from the Shoah? And in that situation, would the Germans and Arabs have killed us in Israel? <laughs> Who can answer that question? Just, no. <laughs> uh, and uh, Haida has a question. In addition to the children, there were many adults that were given refuge and helped. Yes, they were, Haida. And uh, if this is Haida from New York. Sounds then like it, yes. We've talked about this, yes. And I should mention that when I asked Haida about this question about uh, aid given to uh, refugees in Tehran, she said she didn't know anything about it. And she asked a friend of hers who said, don't you remember that family that lived in the complex? Mm -hmm. They were refugees from Europe, and uh, it, Persian Jews gave a lot of help. I think the, I, the, at, their attitude was, we don't talk about it because this is what you did. If mm -hmm. people needed help, you helped them. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that uh, now uh, that they you know, are getting their uh, due uh, 
that people understand and recognize the, the help that Persia, that the Tehran community uh, helped uh, with the refugees coming uh, from Nazi Europe. We have a question from uh, Brian Dave, uh, Davis, Daves. How aware were the Jews in North Africa and the Middle East of the genocide in Europe? I think it came, it came in uh, from reports. They weren't aware initially, but gradually reports came, uh, came especially to the uh, members of the Shuv in, uh, in Palestine. And, uh, and then when you had uh, Palestinian Jewish soldiers in the British army, they, uh, uh, they alerted uh, uh, people to what was going on. And um, Anne and Michael Crook have a question. Do any of the countries you mentioned acknowledge their support of the Nazis or are they like Poland who say that Polish citizens were blameless? Do they, <laughs> I, uh, well, we can talk about Morocco, for example, uh, where uh, the Sultan of Morocco tried to alleviate the situation for his subjects. But Morocco was a very interesting case because the indigenous Jews were his subjects. Other Jews were uh, under the jurisdiction of the Vichy French. So here, when people are looking at Morocco, they say, oh yes, there's this mixed uh, response. But I think that uh, in, in where there are cases where they help, they, you know, th today you're going to hear that they, uh, that they uh, helped to alleviate the situation or uh, the dire situation of Jews in, in their countries. Right. In your view, the disturbances or the, the pogroms, shall we call them, that occurred in 1945 onwards, um, were they caused by um, sort of pro-Nazi brainwashing of, of the, the Arab population, or was it uh, more um, a movement against decolonization and holding the, the, the Jews as scapegoats, um, you know, uh, and, and turning against them. What, 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 in your view, caused these pogroms? I think that it was uh, the beginnings of decolonization and, uh, and nationalism that then we would see, you know, we see those manifestations later in the, the 50s and the 1960s. They started after, after the war. Uh, uh, negative attitudes towards Jews, I don't think that was anything new. There were negative attitudes towards Jews throughout uh, rule, uh, Muslim rule, when, as, as I mentioned, there was this dominant subordinate relationship. Mm -hmm. When Jews were equal uh, and got, got citizenship in Algeria, Muslims didn't get citizenship in, Al uh, in Algeria. So there was, they were, Jews were caught in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, ideology, so anti-colonialism, I think each country had its own, uh, you know, why they left and so, and so on, each country had its own story. Right. Um, Lawrence Julius asks, how important was the Mufti? Oh, the Mufti was very, was quite important um, in uh, leading the, um, the Palestine Arabs in the 1936 revolt. He, uh, he was very important in that he was responsible for decimating the leadership of uh, Palestinian Arabs so that in 1947, they really had no leadership. When he moved on uh, first to Syria and then to uh, Iraq, uh, he was instrumental in uh, alliance with the Pan-Arab military officers in looking for aid from Germany, uh, promised them oil if they, got, if they uh, gave the Iraqis uh, aid for the Iraqi war. Uh, against the British in 1941, but no, nothing worked out. Then uh, he was in exile. He ends up in Berlin. Uh, he, is he is instrumental in forming a um, sort of a Muslim brigade, brigade that uh, could have fought in North Africa. Uh, I think some of them did, uh, Bos uh, Bosnian Muslims, some of them did, but not many. Uh, and he was engaged in uh, propaganda. Uh, Nazi propaganda against uh, Jews. So yes, he was quite instrumental. 
Right. And Odette um, asks, is this history of North African Jews uh, who were affected by the Holocaust documented in the general history of the Holocaust and recognized during Holocaust Memorial Days? Um, sorry, it's just jumped. Well, I, yeah. would, I would hope so. At Yad Vashem, yeah. Yeah, I would hope so. Well, I'm giving a paper at Yad Vashem on labor camps, so they, you know, non-German labor camps, you yeah. know, in North Africa. But it isn't only that. I mean, I uh, wrote this book uh, after a uh, discussion with a colleague of mine, uh, Beverly Gribbets, who uh, we were talking about the March of the Living, and we were talking about uh, the reactions of students, three different groups of students to. Uh, uh, to uh, the Holocaust. The children or grandchildren of survivors had a direct connection with events uh, at the camps. Children or grandchildren of, these are American kids, uh, grand, uh, uh, grandchildren of Americans who came to the United States before World War II, as uh, mine did, less of a connection. And my father fought in World War II, but it's not the same kind of a connection. The third group were children who, uh, from Middle East and North African backgrounds, who seem to have no connection at all. And to me, this is tragic because there is a story here to tell, and there, they should be included in what has become a national, the national narrative of the Jewish people. If World War II is part of the narrative, their story should be included as well. And they should, uh, as uh, the, you know, Spardim and Mizrahim should be included in this, uh, in, the, uh, in this history. Yeah, I, I was recently made aware of, of a sort of disturbing development at Yad Vashem, which is that they were perhaps mm -hmm. trying to downplay the role of the Mufti, for instance, in World War II. And um, a veteran guide told me that there used to be a floor to ceiling photograph of that famous picture of the Mufti meeting Adolf Hitler oh. in 1941. Um, and that was taken down in the 1990s during the Oslo years oh. um, and was, was never reinstated. Do you think that, um, that Yad Vashem is influenced by contemporary politics in its portrayal of, of the way the Shoah affected uh, Jews, particularly in the Mena. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that was too provocative a question. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, so Harry and Angela Goldstein have asked, was it the case or wasn't it the case that the Jewish community in Uzbekistan, uh, that's Bukhara, Tashkent, Samarkand, helped Jews fleeing the Nazis through the Soviet Union on their way to Iran. Oh, I'm sure they did. Uh, along the Silk Road, all, all of the, these communities, as people fled through Asia to China, so look, you know, look at Shanghai, uh, that local communities assisted them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I don't think they get their, their proper due uh, in, certainly in histories. As I said, uh, I, I think that uh, World War II, the histories of World War II have, have to be more inclusive. And Ilana Tahan has asked, what archives did you use to write your book? For example, did you access documents at Yad Vashem? Yeah, some documents at Yad Vashem, personal testimonies. I think Yad, Yad Vashem began doing uh, oral histories very late. And so there are some from uh, North Africa. You also have to understand there's a lot of published material out there, but nobody's put it all together. I decided to use what was out there and put it together. But you also have the, um, uh, let's see, what did I use? I used uh, US uh, archives and British archives. And there, uh, most of the archives had that, uh, uh, let's see, the, um, um, now you're asking, uh, you have to go, you know, think of uh, mm -hmm. the joint. Joint Distribution Committee has, has phenomenal archives on this period because their representatives came to North Africa and Turkey and Iraq in 1945. 
And mm-hmm. so you have, uh, you know, very good records from the joint. Right. Um, are there any estimates of how many uh, prisoners died in, in the labor camps in North oh, Africa? Yeah, I knew somebody was going to ask that question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody knows. Nobody because no. there were no records of there were no records, and yeah. then you had people who you know they were stateless, so their identities weren't known, and no, you just don't. No, nobody really knows. Mm-hmm. Okay, and Leon Meyer asks. Well, he he states that there's the remarkable Megillat Hitler written in Morocco, who and he first noticed it in the Jewish Museum in Casablanca. Uh, there's also a copy at Yad Vashem. Do you know of an English translation? How important and accurate is it as a primary resource on the period? I don't know. No. No. Okay, yeah. So uh, Megillat Hitler, uh, if I could just explain, or perhaps you can explain, <laughs> Riva, what it was. <laughs> Go right ahead. No, well, no, uh, it was a Jew in Morocco who uh, who wrote... Um, who wrote um, a Megillah, who wrote an account of uh, the Purim story, but he substituted uh, um, Hitler for Haman and um, um, etc. I don't know. Um, I can't remember exactly <laughs> how he did it. Uh, but I think that was a sort of celebration of, of the liberation, wasn't it? Of, of um of Morocco. Yeah. So, um, as Jews did, I mean, there were lots of mini oh, sure. Urims throughout um, Jewish history where they celebrate their deliverance from, uh, from one disaster or another. Okay, Alex has a question. Apart from Israel, over 1 million Jews lived in the MENA countries at the beginning of World War II. How long did it take these communities to evacuate the new post-colonial nationalist regimes? How many Jews remain in these countries today? What's the situation of the Iranian Jews held hostage and threatened by the new extremist president? Perhaps I can answer that. <laughs> yeah, well, you just need to follow our, our activities, uh, Alex. And, um, you know, we've been trying to raise awareness of the fact that uh, there was this massive ethnic cleansing of, of uh, about a million Jews in the space of a generation and a half. And we're now down to 4,000 people in the Arab world. Uh, not in Iran, where there's estimated to be maybe about 8,000 Jews still living there. Um, perhaps you could deal with this question, Reva. How long um, did it take these communities to evacuate the new post-colonial nationalist regimes? No? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, well, well, it, it basically, um, it happened very quickly. There was, a, a, you know, a, a, um, a, a mass exodus shortly after 1948. Some Jews were held hostages, some communities, um, you know, the Jews were not allowed to leave. Um, and eventually, um, eventually through outside pressure, um, the remaining communities did leave, uh, but it all happened in the space of about 30 years. Okay, and I, I don't think we will kind of sidetrack into this question of, of Jews living in the Arab world after World War II. That really is another question for another time. And we, we have really been exploring various aspects of, um, of this question. We're coming up to November the 30th which is the, um, the annual day uh, designated by Israel to mark the exodus of, um, of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. And this is something that we at Harif uh, have been marking. Every Israeli embassy has been instructed to mark uh, this event. Um, this year we're doing a, uh, for those of you in England, we're doing a 30th of November event at JW3, and the theme will be uh, the expulsion of Jews following the Suez crisis in 1956, because it's 65 years um, from that time. So, um, 
uh, just check to see if there are any other questions. I think we could have do, do the description of Megillah. Uh, oh, oh right, yeah. So there is a description of, of Megillah Hitler in, in the, the chat. chat. Okay, if anyone's interested. It's per Google, so I don't know what yeah. the quality is like. <laughs> okay. All right, I think Shimon, I think we've come to the end of the questions. Um, unless I've missed anything. So over to you. Uh, Shimon, we can't hear you. Just a second. Shimon, I, used to, I don't think he's still on the chat. I think he's left the call. No, 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 he's there. What? He's there. Yeah, yeah. yeah Go on, I can hear you. I'm here, but you can hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, great. I want to thank everybody, but um, turn this over uh, to uh, our uh, chair, and that is uh, David Dangor, who arrived, I believe, only yesterday from uh, London to uh, Tel Aviv, uh, Israel. Um, and I would like to thank all of you. I think this has been a, a very successful uh, webinar and um, look forward to continue working with you. Uh, David. Thank you, Shimon. Um, I'd like to uh, start by thanking Mina Arriva, sorry, for her work on all the uh, the Mina studies, <clears throat> and especially now with a new book, you bring such a, an academic rigor to the subject, along uh, <clears throat> with Lynn's book, which has had such a far uh, wide-ranging uh, influence. Uh, the uprooted book. Um, and I think it's having an effect. Uh, I last heard you speak uh, in, in May. And since then, uh, I was one of those lucky people who were able to uh, see the uh, play at the Almeida Theater by Josh Azu. Some of you may have done so as well. Once upon a time in Nazi occupied Tunisia. And um, what was remarkable to me was um, how, how that play was picked up with some intelligent background knowledge, uh, uh, reviews in The Guardian, uh, in, in The Times, in Time Out, El Arabi, and, and many other <clears throat> international or well-respected uh, outlets. And I think the, the importance of, of the work of, of Harif and, and, of course, the... Uh, a wonderful combination now that's been going on for a while with SWC, Simon Wiesenthal Center <clears throat> and Harif and all the rigorous academic work is that <clears throat> by accretion, by gradually letting this important information be seen in its context, you do find you can make a remarkable, slow, uh, 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 positive, effect on people's view of this story. And it is an important story. I think um, a number of people think that this story goes to the root of the problems of the Middle East in terms of the Middle East's capacity uh, to tolerate difference. And so it, it is a, a great example. And I, I'd like to commend uh, Uriva for, for um, being such a model uh, of, of um, reliable information. I was looking through the names of all the participants uh, today, and really we have some very important people on the call. Um, I won't embarrass them by mentioning them. Um, now, all of this, though, requires the help of dedicated helpers, and uh, uh, so many uh, people like uh, David Oliver, Alex Roberti, um, and, and uh, Lawrence, uh, working behind Lynn's wonderful work, uh, really uh, is necessary. And, and what is wonderful is that people like Lynn and uh, like Shimon um, have been able to maintain the loyalty of, of a constant group of people who want to help spread their important message. So thank you very much for everyone for participating in this evening's uh, uh, call and, and um, listening to Riva, uh, who, who has so much more to tell 
on this subject and many others. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank, you. thank you. And I, I think um, we are now going to unmute everybody so um, right. we can all and say hello. And we'll we'll um, stop recording now as well. Yeah, yeah. Can I just um, alert 